Good morning, everybody. In the 100 years between A.D. 98 and A.D. 192, Rome had five emperors, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, and Commodus, six if we count Lucius Verus, who was co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius for several years. In the 50 years following the death of the last of the Severan emperors, a young man by the name of Alexander Severus, who died in 235 AD, Rome had 20 acknowledged emperors and many more pretenders to imperial power. Rarely did anyone hold on to power for more than a few years, and some of them lasted only a matter of months. I like to think of the emperors as changing as quickly as the seasons in the third century AD. Any wrong move led to assassination and replacement, not by the Senate, but by the provincial armies, by the provincial armies. Civil wars were extremely commonplace in the third century AD, and it was a very bad time for the Roman emperors who could literally be stabbed in the back at any moment, and many of them were. The Roman frontiers were in danger, the economy was in shambles, and the vast bureaucracy uh, was also uh, suffering significantly in the third century AD, largely because of a lack of central control. In view of this chaotic situation, there was very little time to build buildings, which is obviously what's significant to us in the context of this course. In, in, in many ways, I think one can describe vis-a-vis -vis architecture the third century AD as essentially a wasteland, an architectural wasteland. There were no forums in the third century AD, there were no basilicas, and there were no baths. We will see that the major project uh, in the third century AD was not, not unexpectedly, given this situation, a major defensive wall. That was the main uh, architectural commission in the third century AD, and it's with that wall that I want to begin today, the so-called Aurelian Walls. Uh, before I do, I just want to give you a glimpse of two of those 20 acknowledged emperors who made their way through the third century AD. The boy emperor, Gordian III, on the left-hand side of the screen, and the more mature emperor, Pupienus, who was co-emperor with a man by the name of Balbinus for a very short time. And in fact, just to give you a sense of the flavor of the third century, uh, both of them were dragged from the palace not too long after they had uh, ascended to imperial power, murdered, and their bodies tossed in the Tiber River. If you look at these two portraits, one of the boy emperor and one of the more mature emperor, even though many, many years separate them in chronological age, I think you will see, if you look at the way in which these portraitists represented their eyes uh, in the likenesses of these two individuals in these official portraits, of Gordian and of Pupienus, I think you'll see if you look at those eyes, that those eyes reveal uh, the concern that these emperors had for the state of the empire uh, during the third century AD, a concern that was extremely warranted, obviously. So again, I want to begin uh, with the only significant architectural project in the third century AD in Rome, and that is this great defensive wall system called the Aurelian Walls. Uh, the Aurelian Walls were built for two main reasons. One, because the earlier walls, the so-called Servian Walls, which we studied at the very beginning of the semester, which date to the Republic, 378 BC is when they were dedicated, so you know, way, way back uh, in the beginning of our discussion of Roman architecture, you'll remember that those Servian walls, and I can show it to you with this, uh, this plan here of the walls uh, during ancient Roman times, the Servian walls encircled just the seven hills of Rome. So this central area here where we see the Palatine, the Capitoline, the Celian, uh, the Quirinal Hill, that was the location uh, of that original Servian wall. 
as the city grew, as the population grew, as more people were brought back uh, to Rome through uh, the various wars and through the enslavement of large numbers of people, the city grew uh, significantly in size. Uh, and so by this time, by the third century, uh, the, the Servian Wall was essentially useless to protect Rome from those barbarians that were literally at the gates at this particular point in Roman history. So they needed to build uh, that wall to protect the city. Uh, and, uh, but the other reason was because of, those, because of what was going on on the frontiers, because Rome was more in danger than it had ever been before, uh, because of the kind of political and economic situation in Rome that I've just described. There was a need for further stability and the need to build this second set of walls, again, the so-called Aurelian walls. And this plan shows you how much further out they went than the Servian walls, all the way to the Tiber River. It didn't encompass the area across the Tiber where Hadrian's tomb, Hadrian's uh, mausoleum, the Castle San Angelo, is located. But for the most part, uh, it did cover the main of the city. And you can see it went far enough out uh, that it even encompassed some of the major city roads, or the beginnings of some of those major city uh, roads. A view of the Aurelian walls itself, very well preserved here on the right-hand side of the screen, and a comparison of them uh, with the Servian walls on the left. With regard to the Aurelian walls, uh, they are named for the Emperor Aurelian, who was Emperor of Rome between 270 and 275 AD. We believe that Aurelian began the walls either in 270 or 271. They were not finished by his death in 275. Uh, and they were completed by his successor, a man by the name of Probus, P-R-O-B-U-S, Probus, completed the Aurelian walls and dedicated them uh, right, after, uh, uh, right after Aurelian's death in, a, in 275 AD. The Aurelian walls had a 12-mile circuit around the city of Rome. They were originally 25 and one-half feet tall. Uh, and there were 18 major gateways in the Aurelian walls, 18 major gateways. I think you can see from this view on the right-hand side of the screen that the, uh, that the, uh, the <coughs> building materials were br uh, concrete faced with brick, brick-faced concrete. You see that very clearly here. And of course, it's, it's important to keep in mind that that is different uh, than what the original uh, Republican walls were made out of. Those were made out of cut stone ashlar blocks. Uh, you see them here in this section of the Servian walls that I show you once again. Uh, uh, the blocks that are laid in the scheme of headers and stretchers that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester when we discussed early Roman wall building, both in Rome and in the early colonies. And here, again, the Aurelian walls uh, with their uh, up-to-date concrete faced with brick. But it's a sign of the times that scholars who have examined uh, these bricks have determined that they were not all new bricks, that many of them were reused bricks from earlier periods, uh, from, the, you know, from the previous uh, se century in particular. And the reason for that probably has to do with the fact that, again, because there was so little architectural activity during this period, there was simply no need to make bricks in, in large numbers. And when they needed them for this particular project, they reached back uh, and used some that had been lying around uh, from er of earlier manufacture. So I think, again, that underscores uh, the, the, um, the uncertain, uncertitude of this particular period of time. Here's another very good view of the Aurelian walls as they look today. Uh, Brick-faced concrete construction once again. Uh, and what's impressive about the Aurelian walls is how much of them are preserved. When I showed you the Servian walls, we could only look at bits and pieces of those walls preserved in different parts of Rome, especially near the, the Rome uh, train station. But in the case of the Aurelian walls, we have a very large extent of those walls still preserved today, which is a tribute to how, w how well they were built, uh, that they have stood the test of time. And in fact, when one visits Rome, when you come into Rome from Leonardo da Vinci Airport, uh, the first thing that you see uh, of the city are the walls. You go through those walls, and it announces to you, of course, that you are, in fact, about to enter uh, the city of Rome. I mentioned that the Aurelian walls had 18 gateways. Uh, some of them are still preserved, and I, sh I want to show you one of them here, just to give you a sense of what these gateways were like. 
This is the so-called Porta Appia. It also dates to the same time as the walls, 275 AD, uh, called the Porta Appia because it is at uh, the uh, exact location of the Via Appia or the Appian Way in Rome. The, uh, the gate, uh, I, I'm going to show you how the gate looked in, the time, uh, in 275 and then how it was altered somewhat later. You can see from the monument list that although it was built originally in 275, it was restored by two Byzantine emperors by the name of Honorius and Arcadius, so this is in the post uh, Roman period uh, of AD, and they did that in AD 401 to 402. And the gate as you see it today, extremely well preserved, is the gate of the restoration of the 5th century AD. Uh, whereas this view, this restored view from Ward Perkins, shows you what the gate would have looked like in 275. In 275, it had two arcuated entranceways, as you can see well here. It had rounded towers, rounded towers. Uh, it had small windows. Uh, with uh, arcuations at the top, as you can also see, cur curvature at the top. Uh, and then Ward Perkins believes, there's some controversy about this, but he believes it was already crenellated uh, in the third century AD. If you compare that to the gate uh, as restored by Honorius and Arcadius, uh, you can see that they have removed one of the entranceways. There's a single arcuated entranceway now in the center of the gate. Uh, and they have also encased the rounded towers in these square blocks, as you can see here. Uh, they've left the uppermost part rounded, but not the bottom part. So they have changed it uh, somewhat, but I think it still gives you, again, a very good sense of what this gate and many of the other gates that were part of this very important defensive wall system built in the third century looked like. <coughs> What we see happening uh, toward the end of the third century AD is the return of a centralized, of a strong centralized government to Rome and to the Roman Empire after the bloody third century AD and its, uh, its uh, numerous fly-by-night emperors, as I call them here. And the vehicle of this return of a stable government was the foundation of what we call the tetrarchy. The tetrarchy, which means literally four-man rule. The tetrarchy was the brainchild of a man by the name of Diocletian. Diocletian was a Dalmatian, not a dog, uh, but somebody who came from ancient Dalmatia, now uh, Croatia. From Dalmatia, he was an imperial bodyguard who rose to great heights uh, and eventually became emperor of Rome. He began his own rise to power in 283 AD, 283 AD, but it was in 293, after 10 years into trying to go it alone, that he realized that the Roman Empire had become must, much too vast uh, for one man to be able to govern it alone, and he came up with this extraordinary idea uh, to have four-man rule. We've seen co-emperors before. We've seen two-man rule. There was two-man rule initially with uh, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, for example. Uh, but we have never before seen a four-man rule, but he felt that the empire was sprawling enough that it really needed emperors in four different locations uh, to enable the em empire to be governed and to enable stability <coughs> Uh, to be returned. And that was the concept of the Tetrarchy, which again he founded in 293. <laughs> By founding the Tetrarchy, he made himself the main emperor, the Augustus, but the Augustus in the eastern part of the empire, and I'm sure he chose that because of his own, uh, his own roots in, uh, in, in Dalmatia, in again what is now Croatia. He chose a man by the name of Galerius uh, to be his Caesar, to be his second in command in the eastern part of the empire. He selected Maximian, Maximian to be Augustus in the west, and then Constantius Chlorus to be the Caesar in the west. Constantius Chlorus, more well known uh, as the father of Constantine the Great than he is as a tetrarch. Uh, but he, again, Constantius Chlorus, was the designated Caesar in the West. Order was restored through the vehicle of the Tetrarchy. And what that means for us in this course on Roman architecture is that stability returned, stability that enabled major architectural commissions to once again 
uh, be done both in Rome and also around the provinces and particularly in the provinces uh, that these individuals made their their capitals in a sense and where they where they lived and, and where we'll see they built uh, their own palaces so when we speak of but when we speak of tetrarchic architecture I think we have to keep in mind that we are talking not just about the renovation of Rome I mean Rome itself the re renaissance let's call it that instead of renovation the renaissance of Rome Rome's rebirth uh, under the tetrarchy and under Diocletian uh, but we are also talking about <coughs> architecture as we'll see that was put up in the provinces also under the uh, under the aegis of the tetrarchs I want to just show you what the tetrarchs looked like and their portraiture is also illustrative of what their major uh, architectural agenda was. We see a coin portrait on the left hand side of the screen of Diocletian uh, that, that, that gives his title Augustus as you can see here, a typical Roman coin profile uh, portrait that shows him with a closely cropped military hairstyle and beard. But the much more, and he, he is represented this way in his coins, you know, from 283, the first decade, from 283 to about 293. But the, the image that becomes the image of the Tetrarchs as a whole is the sort of thing that you see here. We begin to see with the formation of the Tetrarchy representations of them as a group. Uh, it's, it's sort of one, one for all and all for one concept. Uh, that they are shown uh, in mutual support, uh, holding each other, in fact, embracing each other in mutual support as they try to restabilize the government. Uh, this is a very, this is a wonderful group portrait of the four tetrarchs that's done in this uh, reddish purplish stone that comes from Egypt called porphyry, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-Y, -Y, and uh, a, a stone that we'll see used extensively in this period. Uh, this portrait is carved out of that. Uh, we don't. We, we have thoughts about where it might have come from, perhaps even Constantinople. Uh, but it ended up in Venice. Uh, and any of you who make your way to San Marco in Venice, uh, it's not immediately obvious where it is. But if you stand in front of San Marco, facing it, and go off a bit to the right, uh, you will see uh, this incredible uh, porphyry group uh, uh, hugging uh, one corner of the building over here. Uh, and again, uh, you can see them. It's done. What's interesting to us, I think, is the fact that it's done in a very geometric, abstract style. Uh, it doesn't look realistic. They are done. Their, their proportions are, uh, are, are stumpy, and uh, they, their bodies, their, their uh, military costumes and their faces uh, seem almost more like, and their, the hats that they wear, these Pannonian caps, seem almost more like geometric shapes than they seem like real clothing and the like. And that is part and parcel of a certain aesthetic uh, that we see developing this interest in geometric and abstract forms that we see in portraiture, but we also see, which is important for us today, we see that in architecture as well, that interest. And I think, you know, perhaps it, it, it's going too far, but I don't think so. I think that the, the taste for that particular formulation uh, has to do in part with this the fact that they believe they have returned or they're trying to return stability to the government so they choose these very solid geometric abstract forms uh, to represent their images be they uh, portraiture or be they as we'll see monumental works of architecture perhaps it's not surprising to see that when Diocletian uh, begins to put up monumental architecture in Rome he chooses first public monuments public monuments that are going to be seen and that are going to speak to this return of stability to Rome. Uh, and he chooses to put them in as visible place as he possibly can. And what's the most visible place in the city of Rome but the Roman Forum, the great Forum Romanum. So we see uh, Diocletian commissioning a monument to put up in the Roman Forum. <coughs> that monument uh, is referred to by a variety of names. We usually call it, and I've indicated this for you on the monument list, we usually call it, the preferred name for it is the decennial monument, the decennial monument. But it is also sometimes called the five column monument, and it is sometimes called the tetrarchic monument. It's called the tetrarchic monument because it honors the four tetrarchs. It's called the five column monument because it's made up, as we'll see, of five columns. And it's called the decennial <coughs> monument because it it honors the decennalia, the 10-year rule uh, of 
the Tetrarchy. The Tetrarchy founded in 293. The monument is put up in 303, so 10 years of rule. And it also honored the 20th anniversary, the Vicenalia, V-I-C-E-N-N-A-L-I-A, -N -N -A -A, the Vicenalia of Diocletian, because Diocletian had become emperor in 283. So he's, he's lasted 20 years, which is extraordinary, considering some emperors of the third century only lasted <laughs> a matter of months. He's lasted 20 years, and his tetrarchy has lasted 10 years. And it's time for a celebration, and he puts up a major monument uh, in the Roman Forum. Uh, let me show you by this map first, or this plan of the Roman Forum as it would have looked between the 3rd century and the 7th century AD. Uh, we see a number of buildings that we have looked at together before. Uh, we can see in the uppermost part the tabularium, the Temple of Vespasian. Uh, we see um, the Arch of Septimius Severus up here. We see some buildings we did not talk about, for example, the Temple of the Divine Julius Caesar and a couple of basilicas that were put up here in the Rep late Republic and, into the August and finished in the Augustan period. The two buildings that we're going to look at today are the Senate House, or the Curia Julia, uh, but also at the Rostra, or what's behind the rostra. If you see the rostra there, right in the center, that's the, the dais from which uh, major speeches were made. If you look right behind the rostra, you will see four columns on a curve, uh, and then another column right behind them. That is the so-called four, uh, uh, the, the so-called um, five-column monument, excuse me, of, uh, of the tetrarchy uh, that we see there, right behind the rostra. <coughs> Now here we're looking at a Google Earth image uh, from the same vantage point that shows us again uh, the Colosseum, the Victor Emanuel Monument, the, Ca the Capitoline Hill, the Palatine Hill, the Circus Maximus. Uh, here are the forum in the center, and we can uh, locate the five-column monument by, uh, let me see, here we, have, here we have the Curia, here we have the Arch of Septimius Severus, and then right, to, right next to the Arch of Septimius Severus, essentially to the left of it, uh, was the location of the five-column monument right behind uh, the rostra. Now the problem is uh, that all we have left of this so-called five-column monument is a single base, one base of one of the columns. And uh, you can see that base uh, it on display right in front of, on a, pet, on, a, on a base, right on a base, on a different base, a base made out of, um, of uh, uh, brick, as you see here, uh, b the base of that one column right in front of the Arch of Septimius Severus, dwarfed by the Arch of Septimius Severus. In fact, I'm always, always uh, on the lookout when I'm in that part of the forum to see if anybody looks at the column base, and nobody ever does. Uh, they're so taken both with the, with the Arch of Septimius Severus, with the Baroque church that lies behind, and with the, with the uh, Coria or Senate House that we're all going to look at today, uh, that they don't happen to notice this. But that is all that survives. So you might ask yourself, well, then how in the world do we know there was a five-column monument behind the rostra and that this is one of those columns? Because we have a depiction of it on the Arch of Constantine, which we'll be looking at on t Tuesday, the early 4th century AD arch. One of the scenes uh, that shows Constantine himself is located in the Roman Forum. And we see Constantine now headless uh, with some of his attendants and other individuals standing on the rostra, making a, an address to the people. He's surrounded, this is very interesting, we'll talk about why next time, surrounded by seated portraits of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius, identifiable by their portraits. And he's making an address, and if you look very carefully, you will see behind him are five columns, five columns that have uh, statues on top of them. That is the five-column monument that stood behind the rostra. So that combined uh, with that preserved base gives us a very good sense of what that monument might have looked like. Now you may be asking yourself, what is she talking about five columns? I mean, there are only four tetrarchs. Is she misspeaking here? No, I'm speaking correctly. There were five columns, uh, but one of those columns was put up to Jupiter. Jupiter, the head god. Jupiter, who was the patron god of Diocletian. Uh, so we see Jupiter in one column on his own, back behind the others, uh, and then the other four columns of the Tetrarchs, each with a, a base with, a fi with a sculptural figural decoration down below. The shaft was plain, uh, and then a statue of each of the four Tetrarchs and a statue of Jupiter 
uh, on the uh, top, and we think that the statue of the column and statue of Jupiter were probably a little bit taller, as is indicated here, because he was, after all, a god, uh, than the others. Uh, and you can see the way it is located behind the rostra, so that again, if someone were speaking from the rostra, that this is exactly what you'd be <coughs> seeing behind, just as we see in the Arch of Constantine. Uh, you also see its location as it faces the Temple of Divine Julius Caesar, which is probably not a coincidence. We do see that Diocletian tried to link himself to Caesar and others, great leaders of the Roman past. And then this basilica completed by Augustus. This was very carefully chosen location uh, by Diocletian to link himself after this, after this bloody third century, as I mentioned, to link himself uh, with the great leaders of the Roman past. I, I want to show you quickly, because this is, again, of course, in architecture, not in sculpture, but I do want to show you just quickly the scenes on the base, because I think one of the interesting, uh, in interesting detective work one can do is to try to figure out, since we have only one base, whose base was it? Which of the four tetrarchs, or was it Jupiter's base? Uh, and I've tried that, played that game myself, and I'll give you my idea, and you'll see whether you think it's a good one or not. Uh, we look at the scene at the top uppermost part. We're looking at the four sides of that sculptured base. At the top, you see two victories uh, with a shield, and that shield has the word in the center, decennalia. Decennalia, that's how we know it's dedicated to the decennial, of the, the decennial anniversary, ten-year rule of the Tetrarchs. Uh, you can also see barbarians down below, so a reference to uh, th th those who have been conquered. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that the figures are outlined in the way that we saw them at Orange and also at Saint-Rémy. Uh, and then some of the items, including the arms and armor, are actually inscribed, carved on the stone, directly on the stone. So this very interesting use of outlining here. Here I don't think the reason for it is the same. I don't think they're looking at, at copy books, but rather uh, that there has been, there is, there's now an interest uh, in this kind of outlining for visual effect. Up here we see a sacrifice of three animals being brought in for sacrifice, and the men with their axes who are going to slit their throats ultimately. The sacrifice obviously in honor of this decennial celebration, this anniversary celebration, uh, uh, making reference to ten-year rule of the Tetrarchy. Here's a scene down here. Unfortunately, in all of these scenes where we seem to have uh, the emperor or emperors, uh, the heads are no longer preserved. So here we have a sacrifice scene, also a sacrifice being made in honor of this decennial anniversary. But the uh, emperor represented here who was sacrificing, whose base this probably was, his face is gone. But you can see he's accompanied by Roma, by the, uh, the, uh, the Senate, the personification of the Senate, by Mars, uh, by Victory, who crowns him with a wreath, as you can see here. And this looks like a figure of Saul Helios with the rayed crown. Uh, so a whole panoply of divinities with whom he, by whom he is being honored and with whom he wants to associate himself. This is the most important relief, I believe, in terms of, of speculating about whose base this might have been. We see uh, four figures, four adult males in the foreground with togas, all of them headless, unfortunately. Uh, but four of them, that's no coincidence, all four standing there. So while we see one of them, this is his base, one of them uh, sacrificing here. I guess one could argue it's Diocletian as the head of the Tetrarchy. That would be another possibility. Uh, but the four of them represented here. But if you look very closely, one of them is accompanied by a child. So my speculation would be, since one of them is accompanied by a child, and since uh, it is Constantine who was most thought most likely uh, to be the one uh, to eventually succeed uh, the Tetrarchs or become a Tetrarch himself, I would speculate, and it's pure speculation, uh, that this may have been the base of, Galer of uh, Constantius Chlorus, of his father, Constantius Chlorus, uh, and that we, the clue there is Constantine. Another building that uh, Diocletian was interested in in the Roman Forum in terms of associating himself with Caesar and also with Augustus was the Senate House, the uh, Curia Julia, it is called, the Curia Julia, because it was actually not built in the Diocletianic period, but b built initially, begun by Caesar, got begun by Julius Caesar to provide Rome with a Senate House in the Roman Forum, begun by Caesar. 
uh, and completed by Augustus after Caesar's death. But the uh, building was, and that's why it's named Coria Julia after the Julian family uh, that, uh, that uh, Caesar and also Augustus were a part of. Uh, but that building, the Curia Julia, was destroyed, very seriously destroyed, in a fire in Rome in 283 A.D. Uh, and so what Diocletian does is he restores it between 284, he begins already in 284, well before the formation of the Tetrarchy, uh, and he completes it in 305 A.D., this restoration. It continues to be called the Curia Julia, uh, but it is at this point a Diocletianic building, but one that clearly, uh, t where he, he instructed his designers to try to keep it as close to the original as possible. Now what you're looking at here on the right hand side of the screen is a coin uh, that comes from the period of the Emperor Augustus, and it purports to represent, I don't think there's any question that it represents, uh, given its inscription and so on, the Senate House in Rome, as it would have looked as completed by Augustus. And he's in fact celebrating the completion of this monument and associating himself through this coin with his divine adoptive father, Julius Caesar. If we look at the form, if we look at the, the exterior of this monument as it is depicted on the coin, you will see that it is a regular square. The, the front of the building is, is, it looks like a square with a very large pediment at the top, although I think that was accentuated here at size uh, in order to allow the die cutter to include the sculpture in the pediment and also the sculpture decorating the eaves. Uh, we see the doorway right here. We see there seem to be a triple window up above the doorway. And if you look very carefully, you will see that there seems to be a portico, a series of columns that are there to relieve the severity of the otherwise very geometrically ordered facade. Uh, so that's what we, that's, um, what we think it looked like in the time of Caesar based on that coin. You see it over here in plan. This is a plan of, of the Forum in Rome uh, in the Augustan period, uh, 10 AD. Uh, we see uh, the buildings that were there at that time, the basilicas, the Temple of Divine Julius Caesar, the rostra, but of course without the five-column monument, no arch of Septimius Severus. Uh, but we do see the Curia, and you see it here in plan as a very plain, open, rectangular box uh, in a sense. So even in its Caesarian and Augustan uh, beginnings, it seems to have been a very straightforward, uh, straightforward, uh, matter-of-fact kind of a building. This is a restored view of what we believe it looked like after the restoration by Diocletian. You won't be surprised to hear that the materials were different, that it's a building when in its restored version it was made out of concrete faced with brick, exposed brick. Uh, so very much a building of its own time. It would not have looked like that uh, in the time of Caesar and Augustus. But they have, in every other way, they have kept uh, to the un underlying geometry of the form, to the use of the triple window with a, car a curved top, as you can see here, an arcuated top, a pediment up above. We don't know whether the second version had pedimental sculpture in it or other decorative sculpture. The doorway down below. But the severity of the brick faced, the exposed brick facade has been alleviated somewhat by the placement of marble revetment at the bottom part of the wall behind uh, a series of columns. So they have kept that portico, that set of columns, to relieve the severity, but also to make this building look as much as they could like the original Caesarian and Augustan structure. This is what the Coria looks like today. It is extremely well preserved, as you can see. Yes, it's lacking its, uh, it's lacking its marble revetment, and it's lacking its portico. But in every other way, uh, you can see very well uh, exactly what this building looked like in the time of Diocletian. Concrete, faced with brick, uh, with the very simple windows, and this very geometric, abstract, uh, 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 ordering, which again, I, I believe, you know, I think the explanation for that is twofold. One, that they are trying to maintain the look of the original uh, Julian building, but also because this is again the aesthetic of the time, uh, this decision to make buildings uh, in a very uh, geometrically ordered, abstract way, I believe again to reflect the stability of their new government. <coughs> this building, the Curia uh, Julia, owes its excellent a re, a, a, a excellent condition to the fact that it, like so many buildings we've talked about this semester, was reused over time. 
Uh, we know that it was turned into a church already in the 7th century BC, uh, that it was restored in the 12th and in the 16th century AD. Uh, at, did I say 7th century BC? If I did, I meant AD, 7th century AD, 12th and 16th centuries, uh, and then again in the 17th century. And it was in the 17th century that it, like so many other Roman structures, was transformed into a Baroque church uh, by an architect by the name of Martino Longhi the Younger. I put his name on the monument list for you, Martino Longhi the Younger, and it was uh, re-consecrated as San Adriano, Saint Hadrian, Al Foro Romano. San Adriano, Al Foro Romano, Saint Hadrian in the Roman Forum uh, was the church. And when I say Baroque church, I mean a Baroque church. It was deconsecrated by Mussolini in the 1930s, Mussolini returning it uh, to its original ancient form, as you can see over here. But this photograph uh, shows the work that was being done in the 30s to, dismant to dismantle uh, this Baroque church into which the Coria had become. I mean, it's really hard to believe that this was the Coria in the 17th century, but that's exactly what it looked like, as well as in the early 20th century. And you can see a bell tower had been added, buttresses had been added to the structure, completely encasing uh, the Coria in a uh, Baroque church. Uh, and we see that being dismantled in this view over here. And I have a view I can show you also of the interior. This was the interior in the 17th century. Impossible uh, to, uh, to see uh, that original box, simple box-like interior that was there in the time of Diocletian and probably there in the time of Caesar and Augustus. Uh, so filled is it with the usual Baroque paraphernalia uh, of uh, you know elaborate stucco work and angels flying to the skies and uh, these these you know and not that we haven't seen this kind of thing in Roman architecture we of course have uh, but you can see that the original shape of this particular building has been completely disguised by Martino Longhi the younger as he redoes uh, the Curia as a Baroque church this is when when they took all of that uh, Baroque accretion off uh, this is what they ended up with this is what the Curia looked like probably very similar to this in the time of Caesar and Augustus, uh, what it looked like under Diocletian, and what it again looks like today. You can see from this, from this view this very simple box-like uh, shape for the interior of this structure, uh, plain walls, a coffered, a flat coffered ceiling, the only, uh, the only light brought in by a series of very simple windows with arcuated tops. Uh, allowing light into the system. And then down below, again, the brick facing, the concrete and brick facing exposed, uh, but with the down below, probably some marble revetment on the wall down here. Very simple niches, arcuated and rectangular niches, but very, very simple ones. Uh, and then here you see the benches, the stone benches on which uh, the senators would have sat uh, when they were deliberating or stood in front of, because they got up a lot and orated, uh, but stood in front of when they delivered their speeches or, uh, or, or sat. And then down below, the original, um, the original marble revetted floor uh, is still preserved. And I can show you two views here in color of that floor uh, to give you a sense, uh, all done in marbles, marbles brought from different parts of the world, but the usual colors that the Romans liked for most of their marble pavements, uh, a white or off-white, a maroon, green, uh, and black, uh, but very nicely done for this um, very simple, very geometrically ordered, uh, but very beautiful interior. With regard to public architecture, Diocletian also built a major bath in Rome, uh, following the lead of Caracalla and many emperors before him, to provide for the Roman people a place where they could go and enjoy themselves, as well as learn, because you'll remember uh, that by this time, these major imperial bath structures, and this is one of those, uh, placed the bathing block inside a much larger precinct that included rooms around it that served as lecture halls and uh, meeting halls and seminar rooms and uh, places for uh, Greek and Latin libraries and the like. Uh, and we see that scheme, same scheme being used here. The baths were built between A.D. 298 and 306 uh, by Diocletian in Rome. They're located near uh, the train station today, so very close to those remaining fragments of the Servian walls. Uh, and you see again that plan here, and you see that the outer precinct uh, has one of these large hemicycles 
uh, that what may have been used for performances, as you can see, uh, and that it is like the other, other uh, imperial baths that we've looked at with the central bathing rooms in the center in axial relationship to one another and in the usual sequence, uh, and then with other rooms disposed around them on either side in a symmetrical way. We see at number four the natatio, or swimming pool, we see which has a scalloped, si the bottom side as you see it here is scalloped, uh, the wall is. Uh, the th number three is the frigidarium, the cold room of the baths, which had a triple groin vaulted ceiling. Uh, from there we go into the tepidarium, you see it here, a small circular structure with radiating arms that give it a cross shape. And then down below, a very interesting caldarium, because we see that Diocletian and his architects have rejected the round caldarium uh, with the radiating alcoves looking so much like the Pantheon, as we discuss, and, and almost as large, uh, from the Baths of Caracalla. They've rejected that in favor of a more rectangular shape uh, that's more similar to the shape of the Frigidarium, uh, but with radiating apses that have a series of um, columns that allow this, uh, uh, views and vistas from one to the other. This is another version of the same plan from Ward Perkins in this particular case uh, that shows again the natatio, the frigidarium. Here you can see better the way in which the circle becomes a cross shape for the tepidarium. And then here, uh, the caldarium below, where you can also see better, I believe, uh, the columns on those alcoves that allow views uh, both from inside out and outside in. And here is still another one. This is the one that you have on your monument list uh, that shows you those spaces once again from the other direction. The Natatio, where you can see very well the scalloped wall. The Frigidarium, where you can see the triple groin vault. Uh, the Tepidarium, with its round shape and radiating arms. And then, most importantly, the Caldarium, with probably also triple groin vaulted, just like the Frigidarium, uh, but with radiating alcoves. Uh, and then all of these other rooms disposed around them symmetrically. Now what's very interesting also in terms of more uh, architecture in later times is the, uh, is the baths of Diocletian were also uh, reused, uh, in a, in a, but in this case not for a single building, for, but for a variety of buildings, including a, a major museum of antiquities, a planetarium, uh, and also a church, the famous church of Santa Maria degli Angeli, St. Mary of the Angels. Now while this plan is still on the screen, I want to show you when the church of San, San, Santa Maria degli Angeli was redesigned, and one of the redesigners, by the way, was uh, Michelangelo. When it was redesigned, uh, what they did was they took the alcove, the, from where we're standing, the bottom <coughs> alcove of the caldarium. They used that as the curved facade of their church. Uh, they used the tepidarium as the vestibule. They used the Frigidarium as the main space of the church. Uh, and also, and, they, and, and, and so that becomes the church, that main, that the bottom part of the Caldarium, the Tepidarium, and the Frigidarium become the church. And then some of these other spaces are used again for other <coughs> kinds of buildings, including a planetarium. I call your attention especially to the ones at the upper right and the upper left, uh, both of which are octagonal spaces, as you can see comparable to earlier octagonal spaces under Nero uh, or under Domitian. Uh, and one of those rooms, this one at the right, uh, to our right, but to the left when you're facing the entrance to the church today, uh, is, uh, is still uh, very well preserved, and I'm going to show you, show you that in a moment. First, here's a view into the church, into the nave of Santa Maria degli Angeli, uh, which again, what you're looking at is, is the, the original frigidarium of the baths of Diocletian. Uh, you can see all the things one usually sees in a Frigidarium, and I show you a restored view of what we think the Frigidarium of the Baths of Caracalla looked like in antiquity. And you can see there's a close resemblance between the, the, the two. The groin vaults are still preserved. Uh, we see original columns here, granite columns with capitals. Some of the capitals are ancient, some of them are not. Uh, and we see a lot of color, uh, just as we would have seen in the original Baths of, Caracalla, uh, of uh, Diocletian. One, one difference is that we see the groin vaults in the uh, Santa Maria degli Angeli 
uh, are white, and that is the work of Michelangelo. Michelangelo decided that he wanted something much plainer uh, for the vaulting of Santa Maria degli Angeli, and it was he who stuccoed it over, and no one ever dared uh, to change uh, Michelangelo's work. But another architect by the name of Luigi Van Vitelli, V A N V I T L L I, love the name, Luigi Van Vitelli. Uh, was at work in the Santa Maria degli Angeli interior in the 18th century, precisely in 1749. Uh, he came in to, uh, to spruce up uh, the decoration, and it was Von Vitelli who added to the original Roman granite uh, columns, uh, who added these mottled, you see these mottled pilasters, I'll show you a detail of them in a moment, with their capitals. Uh, some new capitals to match the ancient Roman capitals. He added a lot of the stucco decoration that you see it here now, and a lot of the altar pieces were, were put in uh, in the 17th and 18th century um, to make it the church that it needed to become. Uh, but if I show you a detail of Von Vitelli's work, uh, you can see, you know, as you stand in Santa Maria degli Angeli, one tries to figure out what's ancient and what is what is modern, uh, but you can see here what seems to be a granite shaft from an ancient column with a new uh, Corinthian capital designed by Von Vitelli that imitates those, uh, the Roman ones that are there. But all of this mottled work and all of the stucco decoration that you see over here added by Von Vitelli in the 18th century. But we, you've seen enough Roman, ancient Roman architecture, especially of the Baroque kind, uh, to know that this sort of thing did exist in Roman times. And I think Von Vitelli has actually done a pretty pretty good job uh, of giving us a sense of what the frigidarium of these baths would have looked like in the time of Diocletian. Now here's the facade, and so you see exactly what I described before. This is one of the alcoves. You can see the concrete, brick-faced uh, alcove that they have. I mean, this is the simplest facade <laughs> of any in Rome. There's nothing quite like this, but it's so typical of the Italians to, to, make wonderful, to take wonderful advantage of what there is. And so in this case, they decided best to leave it as it is. It speaks for itself. They just used that alcove. They added a couple of doors. Uh, created a niche, slapped the name Basilica Santa Maria degli Angeli on the front very simply, put a cross at the top, and this became the facade uh, into the church, and it has, has remained this uh, to this day. Here's another view of the Baths of, Car uh, of Diocletian as they look today. We're looking at the outside where we can see the outside uh, of the Frigidarium uh, with its windows and its groin vaulting exposed uh, on the outside. Uh, this is the tepidarium and the roofing of the tepidarium, <coughs> and over here you can see the curved facade uh, uh, that's the part of the caldarium that survives, used as the facade of the church. And then as you stand here, if you go to the right, uh, you can go and look at what one of those octagonal rooms uh, looks like today. Uh, and what they've done, they've taken advantage. This is a spectacular space. <coughs> this was just, we don't know exactly what purpose this served in the bath originally. Uh, but it's actually a space that's more similar to the caldarium of Caracalla's baths than it is uh, to anything else in the baths of Diocletian. But you can see that they have taken advantage of this extraordinary octagonal shape with radiating alcoves, uh, going back to, uh, to Nero's Domus Transitoria, Domus Aurea, uh, to use as a place to display some of the greatest works of sculpture in uh, the part of this, these baths that now serves as a museum. One very interesting feature, though, that I want to point out to you that will become important for something later we talk about today and for Tuesday's lecture is the fact that you do see them using here windows uh, in, in the lower part of the dome, uh, windows, arcuated windows, uh, to allow light into the system. We see this uh, development in late antiquity where they move from providing light through the oculus to providing light through a series of windows. And again, they're sophisticated enough in their use of concrete to be able to do that, uh, and we see that's a trend. Diocletian was as interested in um, <clears throat> private architecture as he was in public architecture. He was a man, uh, you, can, you can tell a lot about him just from what I've told you, he was very organized, uh, and he planned ahead uh, for his own abdication eventually, uh, his own retirement. And he wanted to live ultimately <coughs> back in his, where his roots were, uh, on the Croatian, on the Dalmatian coast. Uh, and he built for himself a palace uh, in uh, a place called Split in what is now Croatia. And I show you again the map of this part of the world. If you look at uh, Pola, that we, I can't reach it from where I am, but if you look at Pola, 
uh, where that is, and down the Dalmatian coast. You'll see Split right below that. Dubrovnik is at the base. This is actually a view I took of Dubrovnik just to give you a sense of this part of the world. It's magnificently beautiful there, uh, and one can imagine um, how, why uh, Diocletian was drawn uh, to return. Uh, to his homeland uh, for his palace. So we are looking here at the plan of the palace of Diocletian, which is extremely well preserved. This is from Ward Perkins. And you should be immediately struck uh, by uh, this palace because it, uh, which dates, by the way, to 300 to 305 AD. Uh, we see here uh, something that I'm sure you have all noticed already, and that is that he has built this palace in the form of a Roman costume. It's a Roman military camp. It is a little city. It, it's a city in its own right, uh, in the form of a Roman military camp. Why did he do that? That's interesting. Well, I think it had something to do with the fact that the structure was located on the sea, uh, right, you know, right at, on a promontory on the sea, uh, and uh, could easily have been attacked. Uh, and times were still, he, was still, he had brought stability back, yes, but he was very w aware uh, of what he had, had preceded him in the third century and desirous of protecting himself uh, and his possessions uh, in his palace uh, on, on the Dalmatian coast. And so he builds it in the form of a costume. You can see all the elements of a typical <coughs> Roman military camp, uh, just as we saw in uh, city, art, city building, urban planning from the Republic on. It's rectangular in shape. It has walls. Uh, it has watchtowers. You can see they are alternately rectangular and octagonal watchtowers. It has entrances and exits. It has a cardo and a decumanus that cross at the intersection of the palace. Uh, you can see there are the main gateway is on the northern side. The southern side faces the sea. Uh, as you walk from the northern entranceway along uh, the, the cardo and the decumanus, so to speak, of this palace, you will see that they are colonnaded, just as they usually are in the eastern part of the empire, but not in the western part of the empire. As you walk along from the entranceway, you enter into a public court over here, very elaborate, that's still preserved with a, an arcuated lintel. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Uh, then into this domed area here with alcoves. Uh, but note that on either side of this, uh, this, this open space with the arcuated lintel, which is called the peristyle of the villa, uh, you can see on one side a small temple, which is a temple to Jupiter, the patron god of Diocletian, and on the other side uh, a mausoleum, an octagonal tomb. Now that should strike you as very interesting and very unusual. We have not seen a tomb as part of palace architecture before. This is new to late antiquity. Uh, this probably has to do in part with, again, Diocletian planning this as his place of retirement. He knew he was going to retire there. He knew he was going to die there. And he wanted to make sure that he supplied for himself a tomb. He was not going to be buried in one of these major mausolea in Rome. He wanted to be buried at home. Uh, and so he plans for this by building a, uh, an octagonal, not a round like Augustus and Hadrian, but an octagonal tomb uh, with a porch uh, here in the <coughs> villa. And note that it is right across uh, from the Temple of Jupiter. No, uh, no uh, coincidence there. Go through the domed room, uh, domed space into the private wing of the house. You see a room here with a bas basilican shape. We're not exactly sure what it was used for, but probably some kind of reception hall. Uh, and then here, a series of interestingly shaped rooms uh, that was where the emperor's uh, private quarters were located. This is a restored view of what this fortress palace would have looked like uh, when it was built in the fourth century. Uh, we see it here, uh, all of the things I've already described, the outer walls, the watchtowers, uh, the uh, entranceway on the north, the colonnaded streets. You can see the octagonal tomb rising up over there across from the temple of Jupiter. Uh, and then down here, the private area, the private wing. And you can see how the southern side faces the sea. Uh, and there seems to have been an arcuated lintel uh, on that side. We've seen that that's grown in influence and importance since it was first used in the time of Hadrian. Uh, this is the Porta Aurea, or the northern gate of the palace. Uh, you see it in a restored view from Ward Perkins. Uh, rectangular entranceway, lintel window-like with grates above. Uh, niches on either side with arcuated pediments. But most interestingly is the upper tier where you see a series of columns on brackets that support arcades. 
Uh, this whole idea of arcades on columns uh, ha, you know, began, as we know, later in antiquity and uh, continues to be important into the late third and early fourth centuries. We saw it at the forum, uh, uh, for the Severan Forum at Leptis Magna, where you can see again columns, this arcaded colonnade here. We saw it in residential architecture at Ostia, late residential architecture. Think of the House of Fortuna on Anaria, where we have those, uh, that, that, those columns with arches above them that separate the fountain court from the triclinium. So I just wanted to make the point that we see it not only at Diocletian's palace, but it's very common in late Roman uh, residential and civic architecture as well. This is a view of the peristyle as it looks today. Uh, we, have, we are walking, we've come from the north gate, we're walking along, we're hitting the peristyle, we're going to be going from the peristyle into that domed area here. Imagine views through the columns of the peristyle, and some of those columns are still preserved as you can see them, the original columns. Views clearly of the Temple of Jupiter and of the mausoleum of Diocletian on the other side. Uh, arcuated lintel here inside a complete pediment. So that scheme also used as the major decoration of the peristyle in the palace of Diocletian. Here's a view of what the small temple of Jupiter looks like. We're looking, it originally had a statue of Jupiter. Uh, now it has a statue of St. John the Baptist. Uh, but you can see the shape, uh, very much like the Curia. Uh, a box-like shape, very simple. In this case, not with a flat coffered ceiling, but with a barrel vaulted coffered ceiling. But again, very simple, very geometric, and we can see that that barrel vault is exposed on the exterior. We can see the shape of the barrel vault from the outside as well as from the inside. Here a view of the <coughs> octagonal tomb, uh, the plan of that tomb, an octagon with colonnade around it, columns on the inside radiating rectangular and curved niches, but a porch. The whole idea of the porch, not unlike the Pantheon, except that it's octagonal instead of round. Porch on the front, deep porch, freestanding columns, facade orientation, single staircase. Uh, so and this is this, this very similar to things that we've seen earlier. And two quick views, uh, one uh, uh, engraving of what the, um, the uh, mausoleum, the octagonal mausoleum, would have looked like. Uh, with its, you can see it's faced with stone, uh, with its entranceway, facade, uh, and staircase. And here you can see it is very well preserved still today in, um, in split, where you see the surrounding columns, uh, you can see uh, the octagonal shape, and the stonework all still very well preserved, as is the interior. Interior very ornate, uh, with columns uh, projecting from the walls, supporting these projecting entablatures, deeply drilled, dematerialized in the Baroque manner, uh, with lots of sculptural decoration, representations of victory and death, and uh, victory over in hunting, and, uh, and uh, victory in, in war, and consequently, you know, this close association, as we've seen, among all of those. And then scenes of both uh, with a portrait in, uh, of uh, Diocletian and a portrait of his wife Prisca, uh, both of those being carried in these wreaths uh, up to the heavens by flying cupids. Here's another view, perhaps a better one, that just gives you some of the sense of the, of the over-decoration, over-ornamentation, the Baroque effects of the interior uh, of the tomb. So a very, a very different feel to the temple of Jupiter uh, than to the tomb of Diocletian himself. Here he has gone all out uh, and commissioned the most ornate possible uh, decoration uh, with all the Baroque effects that we've described in two tiers uh, for the interior of his mausoleum. I want to show you a succession of other palaces, each fairly quickly, uh, other palaces that were built during this period that may have been, well, we, in some cases we know for sure, but in other cases we're not as sure whether they were in fact palaces for the tetrarchs. This is the one that's the least certain. Uh, it's a palace uh, in the western part of the empire that we believe may have been the palace of Maximian, Augustus in the west. And in fact, I should, I should, yeah, so let's look at that first. And that dates, as you can see from your monument list, to sometime in the early 4th century AD. Now, if you look at the plan of this quickly, 
uh, you will see that it is very, very different in feel uh, from and in plan from the palace of Diocletian at Split. This may have something to do with the personality of Maximian or whoever the commissioner was, uh, but it may also have to do with the fact that this is not on the sea, but in a remote town in south central Sicily, which was much less likely to be under attack uh, than the, uh, the palace uh, at uh, Split. Uh, in fact, as you look at this, you must be reminded, I'm sure, uh, of the uh, villa of Hadrian at Tivoli. It is very similar to that, with a series of sp a sprawling villa, with a series of very interestingly shaped rooms spread across the terrain, interacting with nature, uh, just as they did at Hadrian's villa at Tivoli. Very much a countryside villa, and I think Hadrian's villa clearly the main model. As we walk through this axonometric view, we, you see we enter on the western end. At one, we see a horseshoe-shaped uh, vestibule with columns all around. This villa, just like Hadrian's villa at Tivoli, does have a lot of columns. Uh, we see those here. Then you make an abrupt right into this passageway here at uh, 2A, then into the peristyle court with columns all the way around, uh, a, a pool in the center, an interestingly shaped pool in the center, and then a series of living spaces uh, to either side. On the, at 2C, we see a, uh, a, a transverse uh, corridor. Uh, which is very important because it links uh, various parts of the villa to one another, but it, is, it was also very decorated with mosaics, many of which are preserved, and I'll show you those in a moment. 2D, uh, with its niche at the end, probably a kind of audience hall. Uh, 3 is where the private compartment is for the emperor, and you can see that that, too, is fronted by a small horseshoe-shaped uh, area. Then over here at 4, we see a trilobed dining room, the main dining room of the house with the triple lobes, uh, and then down below, a forecourt for that that is oval in shape. So some very interestingly shaped rooms, uh, and uh, where we see a combination of the, the interest in curvilinear shapes, just as in Hadrian's villa, uh, and in the use of columnar architecture, references to classical Greece. Over here at 5, uh, we see several rooms very interestingly shaped, again, uh, that make up the baths, the private baths uh, of this particular uh, place. One can visit it still today. Parts of it are very well preserved. We're clearly looking at the peristyle court with the pool uh, in the center of it right here. Uh, and again, it is particularly well known for its mosaics. We see a long corridor here uh, with those mosaics. They depict primarily scenes of hunting, and I show you a couple of those scenes here. Uh, and there's been some speculation, if this was not Maximian's, that it may have belonged <coughs> to somebody who, like those individuals who had the hunting baths at Leptis Magna, were, uh, were, whose work it was to collect, to, um, collect wild animals from Africa. Africa is very close to Sicily. Collect them from Africa and send them to supply them to amphitheaters around the world. <coughs> uh, but uh, the, even though most of these scenes are hunting scenes, the most famous mosaics uh, from the uh, palace uh, of Maximian, so-called, uh, at Piazza Armarina in Sicily are the so-called bikini girls. Uh, and I show you the bikini girls right here, and there's nothing like this mosaic anywhere else in Roman art, but you can see why they're called the bikini girls, and they are involved in all kinds of, of athletic activities. Uh, one of them has received uh, a crown and a, 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 a palm branch for her, for her excellence. Uh, this one is twirling who knows what uh, here. These two are playing, uh, passing, uh, playing ball. And over here, we see a woman on the left with her five-pound weights uh, working out. So I mean, this is, this is probably as close as we get to, I mean, when does it, we, this is very hard to interpret exactly what this means and what it's all about and why it's here. But perhaps we can see it as a kind of women's version uh, to the uh, mosaic that we saw in the <coughs> baths of Caracalla with the famous athletes of the day. I mean, perhaps these were famous women athletes of the day, uh, and some of whom uh, were good enough even to be awarded prizes. But the, 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 ju the jury is out on exactly what these were and why they're there. But they're memorable, these inimitable bikini girls, and very, very famous, along with the Alexander mosaic, probably the most famous mosaic surviving from Roman antiquity. Again, I want to show you just very briefly to give you an inkling of a couple of more palaces. Uh, one of these we know for sure is the palace of Galerius, 
uh, in, uh, the northern, in the northern part of Greece, uh, the palace of Galerius. Galerius, as you'll recall, uh, was the, um, Galerius was the uh, Caesar in the eastern part of the empire to Diocletian. And I should mention, I think I neglected to mention, that Diocletian did, by the way, abdicate uh, on the 1st of May in 305 AD. He voluntarily stepped down. And when he voluntarily stepped down, uh, two new, uh, two, the, the, the Caesars w were elevated to Augusti. And two new Caesars were chosen. Two new Caesars were chosen. Uh, and uh, Galerius became an Augustus, and he built for himself this extraordinary palace in northern Greece at Salonica. And uh, we can see from this plan, and I've given you the date of it, to 297 to 305 AD, I've given you a plan of it, and you should be, even though only part of it survives, you should be immediately <laughs> reminded of palaces that we've already looked at, not just today, but in the past. Think of, Di of D Domitian's palace on the Palatine Hill. There's a hippodrome here, just as Domitian's palace had. Although Domitian's palace, it was used, as you'll recall, as a sunken garden. We're not sure how it was used here, but we think may have actually been used as a circus here. Uh, other rooms, including an octagonal one with alcoves, uh, looking sort of like what Rabirius designed again for Domitian's palace on the Palatine Hill. But up above, we see just as Diocletian's palace had split, it includes a tomb. Galerius is also provided for himself and his afterlife uh, by creating a round tomb. You see it very at the uppermost part in this plan from Ward Perkins. And then very interestingly, just like Diocletian's palace had split, you can see two major, what look like major roads, uh, colonnaded roads, colonnaded streets that intersect in the, second, uh, in the center. Uh, just like Diocletian's palace, and then in the center of that, where they intersect, uh, there's a four-sided arch uh, that I'm going to show you in a moment that's still preserved. Here's a plan of, uh, the, uh, of the tomb of Galerius at his villa, in this case round uh, with radiating rectangular alcoves. Uh, you see it here. It's actually very well preserved. Here's the interior, uh, showing again, just as we saw, uh, the, uh, the, uh, at uh, the in the baths of the octagonal room in the baths of Diocletian, use of windows in the second tier, right at the base of the dome, uh, rather than a, an oculus, uh, and we see that also very well in plan. In fact, there were two sets of them, as you can see here. Uh, so they've abandoned the oculus in favor of these windows at the base of the dome, and then from the outside, you can see that here they have used concrete faced with brick for the exterior of the structure, which was turned into a church. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, mosaics when it, from when it was turned into a church, and a minaret was also added at one other uh, point in time. Here's a spectacular view of the uh, tomb as it looks today in Salonica. Uh, you can see it here, the exterior, as well as its relationship along what would have been one of those colonnaded streets with the arch, which is in part preserved, the arch, the so-called Arch of Galerius. You can also see from this view how similar modern Salonica is to modern Athens. Uh, same country, uh, same World War, post-World War II construction, mostly residential houses of five, six, seven stories uh, with white in color with balconies, as you can see. Here's a view of the, art, uh, of, the, uh, of the relationship of the tomb to the arch, these two colonnaded streets uh, that intersect, and at that intersection, the placement of the arch. The arch was four-sided, so the streets could go underneath it. Uh, but it was also triple bayed, as you can see here, single central large bay, two smaller bays on either side, and then the piers uh, decorated with sculpture that give us a report on the exploits, the military exploits of Galerius in the eastern part of the empire. These were Galerius's wars, Galerius's victories that are depicted here, but we do believe that since it was one for all and all for one, uh, that it honored the Tetrarchy as a whole as well, and that there were niches uh, that were placed somewhere on this arch that would have uh, had in them representations, portraits of each of the four Tetrarchs. Uh, another view of the Arch of Galerius at Salonica, where you can see its relationship even today to what was once the tomb of Galerius uh, here. And uh, a, a more detailed view of some of the scenes and how crowded 
they are with one rectangular panel piled one on top of another and decorative motifs in between them. And if we look at a detail, we see the usual scenes that we see on things like this, the emperor sacrificing, the emperor on horseback trampling barbarian enemies, uh, the emperor seated with the other tetrarchs down here and with a host of gods and goddesses and personification. So again, an honoring of Galerius's own personal victories, uh, but an expansion of those to include uh, reference also to the tetrarchy as a whole. We're going to be talking next time about uh, two men in particular, a man by the name of Maxentius uh, and Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great, as I've already mentioned, was the son of Constantius Chlorus. Maxentius was the son of Maximian. So we see the generations continue, and the sons of the Tetrarchs also want to be Tetrarchs themselves, if not sole ruler. And we'll see Maxentius and Constantine do battle against one another in Tuesday's lecture. Uh, but I just want to mention, and we'll talk about Maxentius in some detail next time, especially his construction or the beginning, his beginning construction on a great basilica in Rome that Constantine eventually finished, the so-called Basilica of Maxentius Constantine or the Basilica Nova. But I want to mention just in passing today a, a villa, about a villa that Maxentius built in Rome, on the Via Appia in Rome. Uh, just around the circle and to show you that some of these palaces were still, they were being built in these, in these capitals elsewhere in the world, but were still being built in Rome. And we know that Maxentius built a villa in the early 4th century AD, as I said, on the Via Appia. And rem there are some remains of it today. I show you a general view of those here and a view from the air from Ward Perkins, I believe, uh, that shows you that part of that villa, which is still preserved, was another one of these hippodromes, the circus. And in this case, we know that this circus was used as a circus. The horse races took place here, uh, and that it was built to hold 15,000 spectators, 15,000 spectators to come out onto the Via Appia uh, to see horse races at Maxentius's villa. We also know that this villa had a tomb that Maxentius provided for himself and perhaps for his family as well. Uh, inside his villa, so we see this same idea that we've seen in the provinces being used at Rome, in Rome concurrently. A, uh, a tomb that is not all that well preserved, but there is enough where we do believe it was a kind of mini pantheon. And I show it to you here in two restored views uh, that give you a sense of what it would have looked like, that it was indeed a mini pantheon, that it was round, that it had a traditional porch in the front with columns and pediments, deep porch, freestanding columns, single staircase, facade orientation, a domed, as you can see here. This one looks like it reconstructs an oculus, although I don't think we're absolutely sure that this structure had an oculus, which seems an unlikely thing to do with a tomb anyway, to have an opening in the ceiling and rain coming, uh, water coming into uh, that tomb. But, num but leaving that particular detail aside, uh, we believe it was in the form of the Pantheon. A better preserved tomb that I can show you that seems to have been quite like it uh, is this last monument that I'm showing you today, the Tor de Schiavi, a restored view uh, that uh, from Ward Perkins that uh, was a tomb that was put up in around AD 300 on one of Rome's other major streets, the Via Prinestina, as I've indicated on the monument list. Uh, and once again, we see this whole idea of the mini pantheon but being used not as a temple to all the gods, but as a tomb, uh, as a tomb, a round structure with a traditional porch on the front, a rectangular pediment, uh, deep porch, freestanding columns in that porch, single staircase, facade, emphasis here. Uh, you also see, interestingly enough, that this one we know did not have an oculus, and you can see that they have put windows at the base to provide light. These are not the usual windows that we've seen that were arcuated at the top, but rather round windows, sort of portholes, uh, into uh, the, this particular tomb. Up above, you see the, the plan, as in Ward Perkins, round with radiating, alternating, curved, and rectangular alcoves. There is some controversy about the porch, whether it had a regular, complete uh, triangular pediment or whether it had an arcuated lintel. We're not sure. Uh, various scholars have put forward uh, one view or the other. But the last thought that I want to leave you with uh, is that it's very interesting to see these mini pantheons uh, being used as tombs in late antiquity by the tetrarchs and by others. And if not mini pantheons, octo oct octagonal structures that also look back to the past. 
And I think that's important and it's a nice note to end on because it reminds us that when Diocletian and the other tetrarchs come into Rome after the chaos of the third century AD and want to establish stability, once again, reestablish stability, what do they do? They look to the past. They build buildings in the Roman Forum, but they also look to the great architecture of their earlier counterparts, of Caesar, of the great leaders of the Roman past. Caesar, Augustus, Hadrian, they look to them, uh, they look to their buildings, and they use their buildings as models to indicate that they are in a line of, uh, they are in a line from those earlier uh, emperors, that they're just as much in control, that they have brought stability back to Rome uh, and also to the empire as a whole, which is why we see them building not just in Rome, but also around the empire as they govern uh, from the fringes as well as they govern, govern from the city of Rome. Thank you all. Have a good day.